Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Pokemon the Movie 2000. And if you're wondering why we're doing the Pokemon 2000 movie, well, it has Lugia in it for one, and he's awesome. But recently, we had the Pokemon Go Fest. So we thought it's only appropriate to do a Pokemon themed episode. Yes, and since we weren't actually at the Pokemon Go Fest, we had a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to catch a Lugia. <laughs> I know, that's really what I was hoping for, but I just wish it would have gone better for the people in Chicago. It seems like we could have done this event without a physical location, but to take on that responsibility, they needed to do it well. But we're not here to nitpick Niantic, we're here to nitpick the movie. And the short preceding it. Yes. Pikachu's Rescue. Let's start with that. <laughs> As usual, a cute little adventure for Pikachu and his friends. Kind of doesn't make any sense, but it's the usual fare. <laughs> yes, because that was a very long way for them to fall and get separated. How is nobody hurt? And how come all Pokemon seem to pretty much get along when the humans aren't around? It always seems like when they run into other Pokemon... There aren't a lot of issues. I mean, those Ladybug just went, oh, hey, we got you. Also, uh, here, we'll drop you off here. It's a nice, safe place. Pokemon seem to be very friendly with each other when they're not being forced to battle by humans. Cough. Chicken fight. Cough. Rooster fight, realistically. But I'm not going to say the other one because it's the internet. Yeah. I mean, really. And then, so you have all these different Pokemon living in the same region together. I call hacks. I never ran into that kind of distribution in the games. <laughs> we don't run into that kind of distribution in any of the games, including the current one, Pokemon Go. We haven't played Sun or Moon, and we're probably not going to play Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Thank you for making two games that seem completely unnecessary. I know they're supposed to have a new storyline and everything, but... It seems a bit early to do the upgraded versions. With the previous iterations, the upgraded version was usually a few years in between. Silver and Gold were on Game Boy Color. Soul Silver and Heart Gold were on the DS. A little bit of a jump there. Mm-hmm. And, well, these aren't remakes of the games, unlike Heart Gold and Soul Silver. This is more like Platinum and the other third pillar game, like Pikachu was for Red and Blue. Mm-hmm. This is more like those, except they're doing them in pairs now, like Black and White 2, and now we're having Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Kind of interesting, really. Mm. This sounds like a whole lot of us not talking about the movie. Well, it's how we work. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, the whole communicating through electricity, which is shown in the short and then reiterated in the movie, and all of the Pokemon helping each other and... Why would they execute bee in nests in a tree? Who built the nest? Yes, Pokemon come from eggs, but execute are a group of eggs together. And apparently they can be separated from each other. Yeah, always seemed interesting how a group of eggs will evolve into a tree. Also, you lose, let's say there's six of them, and you only see three of them, and they evolve. And even if you turn an executor around, you still only see the first three, because there's no more behind. And the only time you get another egg is when you get the lower version of Executor, which is more dragon than a dragon. Sorry, Charizard. Yeah. You get another one on the tail. So now you have four out of the six. So it was kind of cute how Scroll went, one, two, three, four, five. Oop, there's one missing. Guys, there's one missing. That's why they're all attached to Togepi. Because he's like an egg and they need a replacement. I was like, well, did they need him as a replacement or are they such... Idiots that they don't recognize it's not the same one. Yeah, though Togepi is known as the egg Pokemon. Yes, which is how this whole joke works. And how they ended up there in the first place. Togepi, oh, look at the pretty things. <laughs> and of course, the rest of them end up down there, not just because they're worried about Togepi, but because Psyduck trips. Yes, poor Psyduck. I He's... forgot how much I love that clumsy comedic relief. Mm hmm. And of course, I'm sorry, Snorlax in a tree. How is the tree not breaking? Yeah, kind of like how when we move on to the intro of the movie, Ash releases his Snorlax on the boat. Brilliant idea. Though as usual, this brings into question exactly how Pokeballs work. 
Yes, as usual. But also focusing on the storm blowing the nests away and all the Pokemon helping, even though they were scared and all went into hiding. Why couldn't the Executes just leave the nest and go hide in the tree hollows with the rest of the Pokemon? Uh, they're completely helpless? They also seem quite glued to those nests. Very much so. We see one set get in and out of the nest because they're following Togepi. And we see all the nests being threatened by the wind when all the Pokemon come out and help. But for the big long sequence of everything's being blown away, that there is so much wind that the entire row of Pokemon is being lifted off the ground, only the nest with Togepi is threatened. Yeah, uh, and there's also that thing we both went, what? And you actually still went, wait a minute, when Snorlax was being lifted off the ground. Yeah, just no possible way. Yeah, I'm like, he's a Snorlax. I can understand that the more Pokemon that are out there, there's more surface area for the wind to grab and pull. But we're talking about a Snorlax here. Yes, and for the Snorlax to be in danger of being pulled off the tree branch, and none of the other nests to be. Yeah. Also, that lovely little musical number. I'm like, so Pokemon have rehearsals? <laughs> Apparently. And then there's Meowth, who's only there for the joke. Yes. Poor and Meowth. for translations. Poor Meowth. I'm talking about the fact that he's only there in the rescue episode just to be a joke and hit on by everything. Physical comedy. Yes, physical comedy. And to have a Gyarados snapping at him, which kind of goes backwards from everything else we saw of the Pokemon all pretty much being nice to each other. Well, except for Gyarados, they're, they're usually not known for having very good tempers. Yes, but there was a Gyarados during the dance scene. Yeah, good point. Well, maybe that one has a musical heart and it was a very, very, very kind magic card. Yeah, because there were other water Pokemon in the water with it and everybody seemed to be fine. Mm-hmm. And there was a Magikarp there, too. Mm-hmm. Well, I would think that Gyarados would kind of be okay with Magikarp, because, like, okay, someday you might be me. Someday. Someday. Keep dreaming, tiny Magikarp. Keep dreaming. You can do it, man! Look at this motivational... That's the wrong motivational poster! Hey! <laughs> uh, and, of course, everything gets resolved through teamwork and friendship. Yes. And then the sun comes out, everything's beautiful, and pour me out flows down the stream and going, uh -huh. Yes, and as usual, the humans have no idea that anything happened. They're like, oh, they must have been playing the whole time that we were napping. Also, this particular movie, in short, happened to take place during the Orange Island arc. Mm -hmm. So we don't have Brock around there chasing after women. No, he just gets a cameo. Because you know he would have so hit on that boat lady. Oh, yeah. He probably would have hit on the sister when they got to the island, too. Oh, definitely. Melody would have been too young for him. So they kind of gloss over in the English version that the role of the maiden is for children. They just say that she's too old to do it now. Thank you for going to be the fountain of trivia because I found an article on all the differences between this and the Japanese original. And I handed it off to her because I'm like, there's a lot here to read. There was a lot, so I just skimmed. So there will be gaps in knowledge. Also, all information was taken from the internet without cross-referencing or vetting, so accuracy is not guaranteed. And we mainly looked it up because we've always wondered about the prophecy, which we'll get to when we get to the actual movie. Speaking of which, we can probably just wrap up this section. Yes, and get on to the actual movie, because, you know, ah. legendary godbirds, come on. Oh yeah. So, what did you think of the short? It was cute. It was, you know, a lot of CG in it, especially for the time. And that's true for the movie as well. Yeah, they, they used the CG for a lot of minor things in the short. Mostly making certain animations easier and probably take less time and cost less. Like how pieces of foreground and background panned away and did different types of panning. Mm -hmm. That can take a lot of time doing it the standard way, which is like moving it a little bit at a time and then taking a picture, which is how you do the actual animations. Nowadays, they just use computers to do that whole panning and and moving around of scenery bits in the computer. So they just tell the computer, move from point A to point B at this frame rate. Mm -hmm. Boom. Because very few people probably enjoy the tedious part of animation. And everyone probably has a different definition of what the tedious part is. That's usually how it works. Well, that's how you get a team together. You find people who like bits that the other people hate. So moving on to the main feature film. Ah, uh, this is the prophecy is mentioned right off the bat. 
Yes, because we've always wondered, because we knew Ash's name wasn't Ash in Japanese. Mm -hmm. It's Satoshi. <laughs> yep. So, what the heck? So, of course, first you have to look at differences in the overall dynamics of society, Japanese society versus American society. Japanese society it has a greater focus on wholeness and cooperation and less of a focus on individuality. Yep, they're more about the group working together, and we're more about the celebration of the individual. Yeah, that's part of why a lot of sports, manga, and anime don't do so well in the U.S. Because it's usually about one person trying to stand out and then figuring out how to work with the team. Where in the U.S., we're all about the all-star players. We probably couldn't name everyone on a team, but we could name the star player. Mm -hmm. Usually the quarterback or the runner. If we're looking at football, we're looking at baseball, the top hitter or the top pitcher. We're looking at basketball, whoever scores the most points. So it's a very different dynamic. So the prophecy in the American version very much singles out an individual. And the whole movie focuses on the power of one. The Japanese version was more about the oneness and the balance between everything. Because the problem was that things got out of balance because the balance between the three godbirds was disturbed. In the English version, you basically mess with the titans because they were called the titans, not godbirds because, you know, US. So the individual details that pointed to Ash were added to the prophecy and he was basically in the Japanese version it was because he was the most exceptional trainer available at the time and basically it was his job because he already had two of the treasures so it was more of a you fit here so you finish doing this because I've always wondered about that even when I first watched I was like what happened in the Japanese <laughs> Because I know it wasn't that in the Japanese. No, there was no way it was that in the Japanese. And we've always wondered, and this gave us an opportunity to, you know, look it up and see what some of the differences were. Yep. But back from the differences, and talking about specifically the American version, I like how they kind of slowly revealed over time how the American version of the prophecy was a pun. Because they gave you hints, but they, they started out with, like, we're believing his version of the prophecy. That the beast is Lugia, and... That the world will get to turn to ash, as in destroyed. Mm -hmm. And then we still get revealed that, oh, it's the beast of the sea is not Lugia. It's this underwater current that's the beast. And then we get to the point where it says it in the right in the prophecy. It's you, Ash. And he's like, I can't do this. Funny, when it was all a game, you were all gung-ho. And even after seeing the legendary godbirds, you're still going, yeah, I don't know. Ash, you already got two out of the three treasures. Also, I would like to ask, because we're specifically at this point, because we're going to be skipping around a lot here. He had to cross over to get the third treasure. His Pokemon pull him on a makeshift sled while Lugia flies interference. But he rides Lugia back. Couldn't he have just ridden Lugia over? Or Charizard, for that matter? Yeah, I would vote Charizard. Charizard is fully capable of carrying Ash. But no, let's have Charizard help pull the sled. That gives Charizard much less maneuverability. He would be much better able to dodge the Titans. I'm going to go back and forth between English and Japanese. You'll survive. <laughs> if he could do aerial evasive maneuvering. Being tied to the sled, any evasive maneuver he takes will jolt the sled and possibly dislodge Ash yeah. and Pikachu. Yeah, it's kind of like how when they're taking Lugia back, Team Rocket lets themselves go off of Lugia because he's being slowed down by them. Yeah, so they do the nice noble sacrifice thing because Team Rocket is only good in the movies the rest of the time they're evil. They have been good in the TV show, and every time they've been good, they've done better than they were when they were evil. Yes, every time they do something nice, it works out well. You would think they would have stuck to that by this point. Yes, but... The series is cyclical, so none of the lessons ever stick. We just keep going over the same things over and over. And now going back to the visuals, I like the design of his mobile base. This He's not an evil collector, he's just a collector who's obsessed. 
Yes, like ultimate otaku type of six, of obsessed. Kind of like that episode of Powerpuff Girls. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of interesting, um, his interpretation of the prophecy, too. As I stated before, how he like interprets it as the beast of the sea is Lugia, because that's what he's most interested in. He's heard of this legendary bird, and, he, and apparently Lugia is not seen as much. But they know he's there. Well, you know, the other three legendary birds within this movie all fly through the sky. Lugia is in the depths of the sea. How many people go as deep as Lugia was in the ocean? Because Team Rocket and Ash and company were all on the water, and Team Rocket was underwater, and they weren't underwater deep enough to even catch a cross current from Lugia swimming. And speaking of that initial storm that they got wrecked in, Team Rocket was too far underwater to be feeling the same currents that affected the boat that Ash and friends were on. Also, I love how she um, conveniently says, we're so far off course. I didn't mean to take us to this island. I guess it's all about that prophecy again, huh? Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't seem like there's any Pokemon trainers on the island. It's like, who normally fills in the role of the chosen one? Because we don't see any of... The Islanders with Pokemon. Especially since how they reacted. You're a Pokemon trainer? Like that's the rarest thing in the world when the series and the games pretty much lead us to believe that this is basically what everyone does for a living. The moment you're 10, they kick you out of the house. Here's a wild animal. Train it. You'll survive. He's only 10. He doesn't even have a job. I guess technically you could consider Pokemon Trainer as a job because, I mean, look at all the money we make in the games. Ugh, no kidding. Never once had to sell my Stardust in game. Though, of course, right now I'd sell almost anything to get some more Stardust in Pokemon Go. Yeah. And why haven't they implemented any kind of trade system in that game? And I'm not just talking about Pokemon trade. I'm talking about so I can trade in candies for different types of candies. I don't care if the exchange rate is like 10 to 1. I want to be able to do that because I have all this candy just lying around doing nothing. And how about the evolution items? I have still not gotten a single dragon scale, but I have eight metal coats. <sighs> I guess we have to go back to the movie then. <laughs> so, yeah, they get to this island and blasted beak. <laughs> it's amazing how that particular line stuck in my head all these years. That's the one line I always remember from the movie, other than, I wish my name, I wish my mom would have named me Bob. Or, right now I feel more like the Frozen One. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the special effects and design in this movie is really well done. It still blends together rather well. There's only certain points where you can tell they actually used full 3D models and, just, and not just used computer to assist animation. Like the scene where they're running down the broken part of the flying fortress. After mm -hmm. it crashes. Yes, and there were a lot of very convenient things that happened in the movie. Oh, look, it's falling. This is falling perfectly for us to run along it. Oh, look, we have this boat up too high. Oh, look, the godbirds have conveniently cut a swath through the ice that we can now run the boat through. Also, they do not give a very good explanation of the fact that the island boat can fly and climb up walls. It didn't climb up walls, it climbed up stairs. Also, I feel sorry for that boat. And not just because it gets completely wrecked at that certain point, but because of... Oi! You, you can't do that to a bottom of a boat. It's probably fiberglass. Which shreds terribly. Especially on stone like that. It's a reason you avoid rocks. Yes, but that was another thing. Supposedly a better explanation of the capabilities of the boat was given in the Japanese version. Ah. Handy that. Mm -hmm. Just like we had to have some dialogue changes to give us some more information about our villain. Because in Japan, you got a pamphlet about him. In the US, you got a Mew card. I think I still have that Mew card somewhere. Yes, I did watch this one in theaters. Actually, I watched like the first three or four in theaters. I did not see any of them in theaters. I only watched the early ones. I, I missed a lot. And I don't think I've watched anything after Lucario and the Secret of Mew. And I can't remember how many I've watched, but I know I stopped watching them. Not for any particular reason other than 
time and doing a bunch of other stuff. Because I still enjoy the Pokemon series, even though I haven't seen the last, I would say, four seasons. At one point, it was getting harder and harder to record. And on top of watching a bunch of other shows, it was just like another one of the ones that I could put aside to watch something else that I really wanted to watch at the time. Even though when I watched the episodes, I still enjoyed it. It's just... I enjoyed other things more. Yeah, well, the series is a bit repetitive and cyclical, and it can be because to every generation, it's brand new. And since I recently updated the animation style with the arc taking place in the Loa region, which people kind of got up in arms about because Ash's style was changed. It was like, oh my god! And of course, people were also like, is he older? And no. <laughs> And I'm like, in every season, the drawing style makes him look slightly older. But no, he's still 10. Yeah. That coma theory is looking better and better all the time. <laughs> um, no, no. I'm, I'm thinking it's all a Pokemon fairy glamour. <laughs> so th everything he's experiencing is like when the Fae kidnap you. Because, like, hardly any time passes for you and you don't age. And then when they let you go, you're suddenly 80 years old and drop dead. Oof. Ow. Oof. I didn't know about that particular thing of the glamour. Yee. Well, if they keep you for long enough, once the glamour releases you, you revert to your actual age. So while it only felt like a few months or a few years, it was actually your entire life. Ouch. R remember, old um, face stories are dark. Yeah, I, I know this. I've heard recent stories that rely heavily on the actual Fae stories. Yeah, so I vote that over Coma Theory. Arceus is messing with him. <laughs> and he messes with us all. So, yeah. Back to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so... There's just so much involved in the Pokemon universe that you can't help but mention other things as you talk about one subject. Because everything touches on everything else, which actually ties back into the movie theme of interconnectivity and balance. Mm -hmm. And speaking of old things from that time period too, this was still when four kids had the license. Yes. Still wondering how Nintendo ever allowed them to have it, considering how protective Nintendo is of their properties. Yeah, but also remember that at the time, four kids was a good thing. They didn't really become a bad thing until they started getting a hold of much more teenage oriented shows and they started really heavily editing those like when they got a hold of one piece and people were afraid they were going to get a hold of naruto and a couple other licenses they started picking up and heavily editing surprisingly enough Yu-Gi-Oh. that was the one that really got people especially since like things were just edited out of that like really thank you little kuribo for pointing out all the stupid stuff Mm -hmm. I'm gonna catch up on those episodes. How do you get behind on Yu-Gi-Oh! Abridged? Tell me that. How do you get behind on that series when one episode releases like every half a year? Oh, uh, we managed it though. We we managed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we still, I don't think we ever finished um, Merrick Plays Blood Rain or Bloodlines, whatever it's called. That, really? that cruddy vampire game. Yeah, he only did a couple episodes, but apparently he did some more episodes recently. I don't know if he ever finished the game, but... I know, it was very entertaining, and it was my Foxy first... Foxy Boxes. It was my first introduction to the song he uses in the intro. Now I hear it on the radio occasionally, and I'm like, Oh, hey, I know this song because of the internet. Mm-hmm. Hint, music industry, don't take down AMVs. Also, anime industry, don't take down AMVs. There's a reason that those are so popular. It makes your stuff more popular. I also like to state once again, DRM is evil. It costs you money. It doesn't save you money. Moving on. <laughs> yes, back to the movie. So we go out in this giant flying ship and capture legendary birds. Why not use a Pokeball like a normal person? <laughs> Which Misty states in the Japanese version. Yes, in the point in the English version where she's saying what Lawrence does is disgusting. She's asking, why not use a Pokeball? And his answer is, because these are collectibles, and to properly be a collectible, something needs to be on display. Which would also explain why for each Pokemon, the capture mechanism was a different shape. Because it wasn't just a capture device, it was also a display device. 
so each one would need to properly accent the bird being captured. But if the point was to put them on display, there should have been enough room for the birds to stretch out their full wingspan. How can you properly admire a collectible if it is not possible to be fully displayed? And speaking of those capture devices, apparently he planned for the contingency of them accidentally picking up something else. Yes, because the cage that the others were put in was not designed with a legendary bird in mind. Yeah, like why did you plan for that contingency? Why would that even be a thing? And if it was a thing, why did you turn around and let them out of the cage? Yeah, I wonder if that's explained in the Japanese version too. It's like, I let them go because you're not collectibles. <laughs> Except for apparently, specifically three members of Team Rocket, a particular Pikachu seems to be the most valuable thing in the world. Yes. I'm sorry, it's an electric mouse. Trust me, you could go get a dozen. I'm thinking Giovanni is just glad that he's gotten those three out of his organization. Yes, without actually having to actively do anything to them. Because mm -hmm, they don't get paid or they got a pile of paychecks back at their living address. Because they always seem to be poor. Yeah, and I seem to remember something about the deli bird having been sent by the boss to like check up on them and that they had some debts to repay. Hmm. Which would suck. And then the way the legendary birds were fighting with each other, it's like everybody was fine on their own island. And then Lawrence came in and took Moltres, so that meant that the other birds were starting to go, oh, hey, that island's empty. I could have two islands. Exactly. Because that's kind of what, the, at least in the American translation, what, what Zapto says. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really make sense. And then because we've seen the movie repeatedly, we were talking during it. I promise we don't do that at the theaters. But we, we were doing quips and commentary the whole time. And, you know, when Lugia shows up, he's like, Guys, I told you to stay in your rooms. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, she was doing a lot of good commentary. Uh, I don't think we could ever do a lot, uh, a riff track to anything we watched. <laughs> Probably not, because it would end up being very scripted. Because I wouldn't want to talk over something watching it for the first time. You know, like the Bronies React to series. Kudos for them for being able to think so much on the fly like that. I want yeah, to I enjoy. So my initial watching experience. I, I think some of that, at least probably most of that, is scripted as well. But still, there are a lot of nice reaction series where they react on their react for the first time, like kids react to. Mm -hmm. uh, that reminds me of this wonderful video I saw of putting a bunch of like 80s stuff in front of toddlers. And one toddler picks an A-track and grabs an, a classic Game Boy and tries to put the A-track in the Game Boy, I'm like, you got the general right idea of how that 8-track works, but it doesn't go in that particular device. No. And if, sticking on my whole thing about, you know, Lugia, you know, playing around that Lugia had separated them, if you use the English designation of Titans, in Greek mythology, the Titans were sealed away by Zeus. They were released and wanted revenge. And with the help of Heracles, they were resealed again for all time. Hmm. I see the parallels there. I wonder if they... Yeah, they probably were aware of it. Because the writers for the American dub of Pokemon were very talented people. And you can hear this and, oh my god, they included commentary on some of these. And every time I listen to them, you can hear in their voices how much they actually wanted to do with this series and how much they liked the original series. But what they were limited to by ratings and and four kids the company. Yeah, just how much their creativity was stifled. Cough, Nickelodeon Legend of Korra. Cough. Yeah, we'll just slash your budget and leave you with the choice of either make a clip episode or fire half your staff. Thank you. I think we've pretty much gone over our, all of our favorite points. Any particular nitpicks that still stand out in your mind? <laughs> Oh, you know me, I can always nitpick. Overall, Lugia's song, how long it takes Melody to recognize it, the way the pillars light up when she's playing, it doesn't quite match. Wow, I always thought they matched pretty well. No, there are some pillars that don't light up correctly. Also, in some of the dubbing, um, it sounds like it should be Professor Oku speaking, but someone else's lip flaps are moving. Hmm, interesting. Mm-hmm. And 
a little bit more on U.S. Uh, Japanese differences. Pretty much everyone knows that the whole Misty Ash slight romance is a U.S. thing that Japan adopted. At this point, it hadn't been adopted. So things like where she's saying Ash isn't alone, she's actually saying in the Japanese version how she's a burden to Ash. And we're like, yeah, she, he still owes her a bicycle. Yeah, but isn't her being a burden to him kind of a thing? Um, I think I don't think it means what you think it means. Yeah, so it may or may not. And some of the other commentary between Melody and Misty was not as romantic cat girl fight type stuff as was portrayed in the U.S. version. They always played that relationship up more. I think it was like one of the few ships that made it canon. <laughs> And gave hope to shippers everywhere. <laughs> if it can happen once, it could happen with mine. <laughs> yeah, but you're not part of the production team of the actual show. Yes, but multiple people think of the same ships. So maybe someday, someone else in a production crew will have a ship and get it into a series. <laughs> Sorry, canon sink ships. End of story. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, that's a wonderful AMV. Yes. Too bad he got so much flack over it from the people who actually originally altered the lyrics because they did a shot for shot video. They changed the lyrics, but for their video, they tried to do a shot for shot match of the original song. Mm. And they went after the person who did the AM the animated AMV that you and I enjoy so much. Mm. Well, because it's Haruhi. Yeah. Who else would have the power to ship anyone she likes? This is why the end of that is so terrifying. Yes. But back to the Pokemon movie. Yes. And I really did enjoy watching it again. It was fun. I forgot how silly Team Rocket was. I really did enjoy them in the show. Yeah, I didn't forget how silly Team Rocket was. I'm thinking, not Jesse and James, but I'm thinking a nice, easy cosplay might be Team Rocket Grunt. Mm -hmm. I actually think I may have seen some Team Rocket Grunt cosplayers at a um, smaller local con last year, but I was kind of focused on Steven Universe cosplayers and Ruby cosplayers. Mm -hmm. And to their advantage, Rocket Grunts would kind of blend into the background. Yeah. But if you were to pull off a Rocket Grunt cosplay perfectly, go through and memorize as many, as many little lines as you can from the games and look up poses for the Rocket Grunts. And if someone makes eye contact with you, randomly go into that pose and shout the line. <laughs> it would be awesome. But so far, all I have towards that costume is a fake Pokeball. I got several of those. On keychains. Hey. And jumping back more to the beginning. Oh, do we have time to let our Pokemon out while we're still on the boat? So you let your water Pokemon out into the open ocean. You're not concerned that any other wild Pokemon might bother them? Also, how not fair that Pokemon like Lapras and Staryu have to swim while everyone else gets to ride? Yes, they do need physical activity, and yes, they are water Pokemon. They probably enjoy swimming to a degree, but come on, that hardly seems fair. Well, some of them are, like, water-exclusive. Like, Staryu really technically is a water-exclusive Pokemon, and so is Lapras. She can get on land, but it's very awkward for her. Mm-hmm. So they can't really follow around and be out on land. I mean, we even saw that in the series um, with Misty letting Horsey out in a fountain because she hadn't been able to let Horsey out for a while. Which still makes us wonder, okay, how do the Pokeballs work and what do the Pokemon do while they're in there? Because how do they always seem to know what you wanted as soon as you let them out? I could see that in a battle situation, but when they're let out inside the Fortress Tower, they all immediately start attacking Moltres' cage. How do you know that? And it also was nice to see Weezing and Arbok again. For all of two seconds, poor additional comic relief Pokemon. Because in Team Rocket, you don't get to have any really great Pokemon. Because anything really good goes straight to Giovanni. You guys get what's left. Mmm. I think that's pointed out in the webcomic we read that I'm working on catching up to. Cough, Mokepon. Cough. 
<laughs> well, I think it's a very valid point because unless it's very recently stolen, we pretty much don't see any of Team Rocket in the anime having good Pokemon. Uh, so should we wrap up our thoughts on this movie? <laughs> As scattered as they've been, probably a good idea. Well, overall, I did enjoy watching it again, and it felt good after coming back from doing a Pokemon event. Yes, that's right. We're actually recording this on the night of GoFest. So we had an awesome day, and our hearts go out to the people who went to the Chicago event. Mm-hmm, because we had an awesome day, we did a lot of walking, especially based on what my pedometers say. Mm-hmm, and not to mention the number of eggs that hatched while we were walking around. So yeah, I really enjoyed watching the movie again. The short was fun. The movie was funner. The special effects were pretty nice, especially for the time period it came out. I really like Lugia. I've always liked Lugia. Looks over at his statue that Amber picked up for him after he missed the chance to get it because of a pre-order mistake. Yes, I couldn't believe that the store was actually willing to just sell it by itself, so I bought it. I wish I had shelf cleared. I think they had Lugia and Ho Ho there. Yes, and multiple boxes. Oof. Dang. So, your thoughts? <laughs> it was fun to watch. The four kids edits and just the overall childishness of it. But it's aged reasonably well. And it was fun. It was fun to watch it today after the GoFest. You know, I've been so much off and away from the Pokemon franchise that it's kind of nice to have a little nostalgic trip. And yeah, Lugia has always been my favorite and out of the Godbirds. And if you look back at this movie, you can kind of see why. The other three all act like jerks. Like, no, this is my, I want my, I, I'm tired of being grounded. We're all ganging up on you, Lugia. We're tired of being grounded. Uh, and that pops an idea into my head. What's your favorite legendary dog? Suicune. Also mine. Just something about Suicune. He looks so cool. And he's like second, and I always forget the third one. Raikou. Ah. Yeah, I'm not huge on Entei, even though we get a lot of Entei in the movie where the unknown create an Entei. I like Raikou in the episode, I think it was actually three episodes, where we were getting that set of episodes that aren't about Ash, and we had a trio of slightly older trainers running into a Raikou and helping it escape from capture. Ah. So anytime we have episodes that give you a little more connection with the legendary, it's easier to pick a favorite. You know, the Entei we got in the movie wasn't a real Entei, and it wasn't being nice. You know, it was following a child's whims. Mm-hmm. So, outro? Outro. And this has been our thoughts on Pokemon the Movie 2000. Yes, because it came out in the year 2000. Don't say that. I feel old now. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this, please subscribe and watch some more. We have plenty of videos on different pop culture topics and a video series called Ember's Reading Room, where we look at children's books from an adult perspective. We have different playlists for that as well. Please go and give them a watch. And if you liked my art, you can find more of it on DeviantArt, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and when there's more, I'll add more here. <laughs> if you really liked my art, or really like this channel and feel like supporting us, please head over to our Patreon or our coffee. Patreon starts at a dollar, coffee starts at three. Also, if you want a piece of art of your very own, I also take commissions. Links in the description. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening.